I'm Bola Amusa, partner and biotech analyst at Chardon. Uh, as it turned out, 2020 and 2021 were even uh, better years in some ways in terms of validation of genetic medicines, this time driven especially by the mRNA space uh, meeting on me medical needs in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, what we're seeing now is that manufacturing is an incredible asset, whether it comes to avoiding industry growing pains or capitalizing on multi-billion dollar market opportunities like the pandemic. So to understand where important manufacturing technologies are heading in the years ahead, we're now convening the panel, The Future of Manufacturing. For this panel, I'm joined by, in alphabetical order, Sandy Forbes, who's president and CEO of Mira GTX, Jeff McKay, who's president and CEO from AvroBio, and Andre, Andre, Andre Zarur, uh, co-founder, president, and CEO of Greenlight Biosciences. So thank you all for joining. So the format of this is a 40-minute session, uh, which is Q&A uh, led by me. Uh, it, uh, people who are listening can feel free to ask questions in the box below. So I wanted to start with a question to the group. Uh, would you each orient us in terms of what you consider the most important manufacturing advancements in your space in recent years. So we'll start with Zandi to Jeff, followed by Andre on this one. So re recent years, I would say the last five years, uh, Mira started six years ago. And at that time, there was no uh, really commercializable or even uh, industry AAV manufacturing process. So I think the for, from our perspective, the development of processes that can make commercial grade safe reproducible material for AAV has been you know a huge advance that's still not perfect but um, some of us have have got those sorts of platform processes now uh, ready to fit to multiple viral vectors. Jeff? Yeah, and of course I'm coming from a, a Lenti and ex vivo bias but I, I could think of three. One is automation to reduce both cost of goods, but also perhaps the only way to globalize and to scale. Uh, secondly, is that additional commercial capacity has definitely arrived, but with the huge caveat that more is needed and the demand is still outpacing supply. And then the, the third, which of course we will talk about, it's so important, is that analytical characterization of the drug product and the vector and the fact that FDA is expecting deeper product understanding and characterization of critical quality attributes, sort of a quality by design type mindset is, is definitely here. And, and maybe that was less so the case a few years ago. And Andre for mRNA? Yeah, it's kind of a fair question because of course, a year ago, nobody had ever, you know, registered an mRNA product and today hundreds of millions of people have received mRNA vaccine. So it's all been about, you know, how do you make commercial grade mRNA material at scale? Uh, and despite all of that over the last, you know, 12 months, and despite the tremendous progress, we've only really been able to cover about 5% of the world population. So a lot more will be needed to get those mRNA vaccines to everybody in the world. Understood. And, and then I wanted to touch on the topic of, uh, let's say, growing pains for the gene therapy space. So we've got um, ex vivo uh, and in vivo represented on this panel. W would you each discuss what you see as the most relevant manufacturing issues for your space and what best practices are out there to avoid the so-called growing pains? Uh, let, let's start with Jeff on this one, then Zandi right after. Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> obviously it's a hot topic because 2020 saw this steady drumbeat of, of delays that are directly related to CMC. And so I, I can kind of break them out into a few different buckets. The first of which are assays and the, the fact that there's high variability of potency assays or the fact that regulators would not accept just one potency assay of being sufficient, um, or if the potency assay didn't correlate with clinical effectiveness or mechanism of action, that has led to, you know, as you're aware, some pretty high profile delays, but also related to assays. If analytical comparability just doesn't jive, then it, it's gonna translate into substantial delays. So that's one big bucket. And, you know, you can list a number of very, very important delays that transpired in late stage clinical development programs as a result of that. 
The second is sort of I can group a scale up or comparability. And um, I think that comparability of a scaled up process can, can be invalidated or the long-term data won't be properly factored in if good comparability hasn't happened to be able to link your, you know, your registration caliber programs to some of your early programs. And we've also seen examples where comparability of an adherent platform um, doesn't translate into a suspension platform on the vector side, which has led to big delays. And then just delays of scale up in general, uh, certainly on the, on the Lenti side has, has occurred. But then the, the final potential um, growing pain is related to process validation and process control or if process validation isn't is inadequate. And so, you know, I think are, are any of these addressable? I would say they're all addressable. You just need to start early, rigorously characterize and allow for process changes, prioritize assays early, and just get your big process changes in either pre or early clinical development. Now, none of this are things that are not well referenced in the, the FDA gene therapy CMC guidelines, for example. Sandy, anything to add? Uh, I would say very similar for AAV. Um, my bullet point answer to this was to have your commercial process when you file the IND. And that, you know, and that covers your potency assay, all of your QC, uh, and, and, and allows you to put in motion your robustness so you, you know how the process is controlled. Um, I will say that one of the, that's obviously very difficult to spend the amount of money and infrastructure and, and time pre IND to have all that in place. Um, but having a, a platform process that can be more rapidly fit to multiple different capsids, multiple different viral vectors, all with the same cell line and the same overall structure of the process actually speeds your ability to have that sort of process at IND, which can then be scaled and tweaked if that is a scalable process, like the process at Mira, that can be then scaled throughout the development process. So um, I essentially agree. Potency assay is always uh, the more difficult of all of the assays and to start on that as soon as possible, like preclinical, is is going to be helpful. Got it. And so, Andre, I was a question to you specifically, since mRNA has been less about growing pains and more about unprecedented success. So, could you talk about the capabilities of your space that have allowed companies to rapidly scale uh, to meet global demands? That's a really interesting question, Bola, because of course we talk about unprecedented success, but we talk about it from the perspective of a very limited number of people. Indeed, mRNA has had unprecedented success in the US and a few countries in Europe. But if you were to look, and, and the reason why that was is unprecedented investment, right? The availability of funds from the US government principally to de-bottleneck essentially all of the raw material supply chains to be able to enable Moderna and Pfizer to make uh, hundreds of millions of doses of mRNA vaccines had a direct impact on that. But if we look at mRNA uh, in the global perspective, it hasn't been as successful as it should have been had we had the advanced manufacturing technologies that are present in other fields. In other words, if you look at the US and Europe, you know, availability of the mRNA vaccine is no longer a problem. There's in fact more vaccines available than people that are willing to take them. If you look at everywhere else in the world, Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia, uh, South Asia, Russia, and so on, there's no nowhere near enough uh, supply of raw materials to make mRNA vaccines or mRNA vaccines themselves. And so it's a success driven by, allow me to use this phrase, brute force investment, not by technology development. And so for act two, act one being, okay, we got the US and a, and a few countries in Europe out of the way, act two is we need to vaccinate the rest of the world. We need manufacturing technology of entire entirely different uh, caliber than what we have today. What we have today is the IVT process that you and I used in the labs 
you know, when we were making microgram quantities of RNA for analytical, right? And, and, and of course, those have been essentially brute force through significant investment to enable market access. But that market access is not going to be sufficient to dose the number of vaccines that we need around the world. And with the issues that we have seen with every other modality of vaccine, uh, the AV uh, vaccines from AstraZeneca and J&J, &J, the recombinant proteins uh, vaccines that just keep getting delayed and delayed and delayed, it seems like the way to respond globally to the pandemic will be mRNA. We need to do a lot better in this global manufacturing setting. So for each of you, I'm interested in the CMC issue that keeps you up at night for your company specifically. So if it's been covered earlier, just the one-liner is great, but let's start with Zandi and then to Jeff and then Hunter. At the moment, I would say the biggest thing that keeps me up at night is delays from external QC, requiring a tail time yeah, for release. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say similar. I mean, C CMOs let you down, yeah. you know, in, in general, is that we've dealt with delays and CMOs have a tough business right now. The staff turnover is incredible, capacity issues. It's tough getting new untrained people to follow SO SOPs. So, you know, I think that as a control freak, you much feel better what you can control versus relying on others. We, we of course, try to mitigate that by having European, US and Asia. So we view it as a sole source vendor, which we have to have backups and backups of the backups. But of course it, it, it is something that, that you know, inherently has a risk to it. And, and from our perspective, you know, QC, bringing that in house at our new facility is one of our top priorities. So we will be able to qualify, validate all QC release to be able to release materials ourselves. Andrew? I mean, everything. I don't sleep because of stupid CMC. I mean, <laughs> look, uh, everything about mRNA is, is a challenge right now, right? So the supply of every raw material for mRNA is limited, from nucleotides to enzymes to DNA plasma to capping reagents to lipid nanoparticles. Each one of those materials, of course, has to be qualified. The release assays are in development. They, you know, we obviously have emergency use authorization for these things. Eventually, that goes away, and we have to have the entire GMP process revalidated and re-audited. And, and as, as Sandy and Jeff have said, well, you got to bring it in house to have control over it. Now, the difference, of course, is that, you know, if we are to be successful in our plan, we need to be generating tens of billions of vaccine doses per year in multiple countries around the world. And so we need to establish a global network of GMP manufacturing facilities in which we need to validate everything about the CMC process from beginning to end. And so from supply raw materials to cost raw materials to qualification to having a QMS system that is compatible in, you know, potentially seven or eight different facilities in places ranging from Rwanda to Singapore to Canada. I mean, yeah, I, uh, the reason I don't sleep well is because of CMC. Got it. So a question to Jeff specifically, we've seen that in the ex vivo gene, gene therapy space, uh, arguably more than some other spaces, manufacturing defines the product's attributes. So could you discuss this issue and the best practices you see around it? Um, yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> I think what, what's kind of fun about the ex vivo lentigenes therapy space is we kind of imagine ourselves like having a, a, being a pilot in, with a cockpit of just a few gauges that, that you have to get right in order to have a properly produced product. And those gauges really our, our vector copy number, transduction efficiency, the cell dose, and, and the intensity of conditioning. And I think the, the happy circumstance is that when you get that right, gene therapy, lenti gene therapy has, has really worked every time now. And there's between anywhere from 300 to 500 patients and a, a dozen different diseases. And so I don't think that there's sort of a mystery as to what you should have your eye on. Now, of course, in, in terms of how do you how do you make that work? Vector copy number and transduction efficiency are really directly correlated with the quality of your vector, you know. And so I think just taking a an, an off the shelf old NIH worker horse uh, vector is is how we began. But then we had we definitely had to optimize that. And now I do believe we have a state of the art for plasmid lenti vector system that 
um, has a 10 to the ninth titer that can be manufactured in large bioreactors. So I think that sort of addresses VCN and transduction efficiency because now that that's in place, we can look at multiplicity of infection and really back, backwards engineer a vector copy number that we desire. And, and why, why that's important is because I think what you want is a vector copy number that's sufficient, but FDA, for example, would like you to keep it below five. And so, you know, I think depending on the disease, we can target whatever VCN we want now, but that certainly wasn't the case when we started out. So a lot of CMC and process development innovation had to, had to be built around that. And then in, in terms of the drug product itself, which gets you to the cells, you know, there's volume of cells where we have a, a certain threshold that we want to meet. And we learned a lot from the stem cell transplant field, you know, what, what volume is required to enable proper engraftment. But in terms of quality of cells, we have to make sure that we have a nice mix of short-term engrafting cells, so progenitor cells, plus the true HSEs that really lead to that long-term durability. And because we cryopreserve our cells, we also have to not only get it right on the front end, but make sure that there's a proper cell viability at thaw. And so, you know, I think that we, we kind of try to simplify that down to this cockpit and just make sure that e each of these parameters are trending well above any release criteria. And if there starts to be any drift, we can take action early. So, I mean, in, in your space, Jeff, a lot of the results, um, you know, let's say from, from the entire space, sometimes the results can seem like miracles. Um, so why haven't we seen broader use of hex vivo anti GTs? Is, is it a manufacturing issue? And if so, what's going to solve, solve that? Um, I, well, I, I think in general that I, I agree. I mean, I think, again, looking at those dozen indications across inherited blood disorders, primary immunodeficiencies, lysosomal disorders, I mean, the field is really batting a thousand in terms of efficacy and in terms of, of durability. But I, I don't, you know, I think the reason the field is successful is because we're getting better and more sophisticated at matching the appropriate vector to the appropriate disease. And Lenti is not a one size fits all. I think that really what we've come to appreciate is that when, when what is required in terms of the target product profile is, you know, a long-term head to, head to toe distribution, meaning above the neck and below the neck manifestation, then that tends to be where the lentiviral gene therapy has, has really thrived. So that's not every, every disease, but I think if you carefully target the disease, Lenti has, has really delivered in those dozen or so indications. I think also, although the safety profile of the gene therapy has been excellent, we also recognize that in order to ensure engraftment in both the bone marrow and the microglia compartment, there's a concomitant conditioning step. And that conditioning step comes with a set of tolerability issues, which again, may limit the applicability is the overall value proposition has to be that the benefit outweighs the cost. And the cost for us tends to be, you know, little to no adverse events associated with the gene therapy and a predictable set of transient effects with the conditioning regimen. But that, that is maybe the second issue which limits use. Got it. And, and, uh... Back, back to the group, I wanted to focus on regulatory standards. I mean, from your perspective, and I, I recognize, Andre, it's a little different for mRNA, um, are regulatory standards tougher now than the years past? So, Zandi, why don't you start, then Jeff, and then Andre, anything you have to say on mRNA as well? I'm not sure that standards overall are tougher. I think uh, standards for pivotal material and for therefore commercial material have always been, been tough and more companies are now moving to that later stage of development. They're not just making some material for a phase one study, but really moving into a stage of clinical development where they're coming across these really high standards that you, you have to meet for Pivotal and ultimately supporting a BLA. Um, I will say that, you know, currently, right now, the FDA is somewhat overwhelmed from the work it's been doing during COVID. So there may be some delays or uh, 
requests for information due to that. But in general, I, I think that, you know, regulatory agencies globally want to ensure that you have safe, effective treatment that is reproducibly produced uh, whenever you're looking for approval. Yeah, I, I know there are different views on this, but I agree completely with Sandy. I think that, that, you know, because the clinical data has been so compelling in gene therapy, I think there was almost this perception of Wild West that we're just going to be able to muscle through. And, you know, frankly, people like Peter Marks from CBER have been standing on podium after podium after podium for years and years, imploring us to take them seriously when they say they're not going to cut corners on analytics and CMC. And the gene therapy FDA guidelines on CMC have existed for years. They're very, very clear. So this question about is FDA tightening up or not, I mean, it's almost moot. It, let's, let's just say they're tight and they're gonna stay tight. I think, I, but I do agree that what's really happened is the field has reached the stage where you know, suddenly what it means to be phase three ready is, is rigorously enforced and what it means to be BLA ready is is rigorously enforced you know i'm sort of in the camp that it always was that yeah. and that we just had to take fda at their word yeah i think that uh, there's a very big difference between mrna vaccines and the promise of mrna therapeutics clearly when you have hundreds of millions of people getting infected uh, and, and mrna is a tool that you're going to use to control the pandemic yeah we're going to do all kinds of things to get through this. Um, but this will pass. I promise you it will pass at some point. And then, you know, the promise of mRNA therapeutics will begin to emerge. And there are some number of questions that are going to be incredibly important to, to answer. As you know, mRNA therapeutics can be used for a variety of different modalities, including gene therapy, including gene editing and whatnot. And so, uh, you know, I think the regulatory framework for manufacturing around RNA is going to be highly dependent on the field. It's going to be very, very different if we're making a one-time vaccine than if we're making a booster vaccine, than if we're making a therapeutic for cancer, than if we're making a therapeutic for a chronic disease, than if we're making a gene therapy, right? And, and I think that, you know, those are only now beginning to be understood. Remember, as of a year ago, we didn't even know if mRNA was ever going to yield a registered product. And so this field, as it relates to mRNA, is truly in its infancy. And I think the FDA and other regulatory agencies around the world are only now beginning to comprehend how complex an mRNA therapeutic is going to be. From the RNA itself to all of the different functions that the RNA itself will have on the body, to the impact on the immune system, to the impact of accumulation of the lipid nanoparticle in different organs of the body, those are to be determined. And so a lot more will be to come. I will say, one thing, though, I think that very similarly to all other modalities of biotherapeutics, the process will define the product, and we're going to have to leave with that. Understood. So it is called the future of manufacturing panel, so I'm going to focus on the future a little bit more now. Um, another group question. So what important innovations would best enable your platform to meet or exceed goals? Mm -hmm. um, so I'll start with Andre on this one to Jeff and finish with Sandy. Yeah, so again, you're going to get two different answers if we're talking about vaccines and if we're talking about therapeutics, right? In the vaccine world today, uh, I think the most fundamental advancement that we need is a lipid nanoparticle system that is stable at room temperature, or in fact, that can stabilize um, the RNA at, at near room temperature. Refrigeration is fine. Because what's happening today, of course, is given the, necess the necessity to deep freeze all these vaccines, it's causing all kinds of problems, not only with distribution, but even with fill and finish. Right? If you need to fill and finish something that is going to go into a negative 20, you know, your cost and the type of materials that you can use is, is very different than if you're able to stay at refrigeration where you can actually pack in a bag or a plastic vial. And so today, to break the problem that we have with global distribution of a COVID vaccine, we need to figure out the lipid nanoparticle stability. And then, of course, we need to figure out the supply chain for all of the other materials. Right? As you know, Greenlight uses a very different process a biological process compared to the Moderna and Pfizer chemical process. So we don't have the same dependencies on the third party suppliers that they do. And therefore our platform is more robust in meeting those global challenges. Um, 
And then, of course, it's a different story when you move to therapeutics, because there, you know, the supply and the volumes of material that you're going to need are quite different. And so what becomes the real bottleneck or the real change for innovation in manufacturing that we're going to need is this, uh, this idea of portability, right? The promise of our day is that you give access globally to advanced medicines, which of course is very difficult to do with most other modalities. In order to fulfill that promise of global access to advanced medicines, you're actually gonna to have to have distributed manufacturing. And so the ability to establish relatively simple manufacturing facilities around the world serve to not only combat the threat of pandemics, but also to make healthcare globally more equitable by having local capabilities of developing of advanced medicines. And so that will require this sort of global coordination of manufacturing regulations, will require a uniformity on the, on the unit operations within the manufacturing process, will require distributed analytics and external quality control, um, you know, to be able to make sure that every medicine that we're making in every part of the world is actually the same. Yeah, so from, from my side, I, I, I mean, first of all, the, the two big things that we've been working on for five years are now in place, which is fully automated manufacturing and production of vector and large bioreactors. So, so I think we're, we're grateful for that. I think if we look forward, the, the thing that can really change the timing of how we bring medicines forward is an innovation on the regulator side. And by that, what we mean is utilization of platform production processes and platform analytics instead of customized processes and analytics. So to be able to have a, a common data package, seeing as how you know we have one engine, same cells, same vector, different transgene. So if we could find a, a way to utilize the platform better from a regulatory point of view, I think that would be really material. In terms of the product itself, uh, we do see the opportunity for improvement on cell selection and isolation during the apheresis, you know, the, the early steps. And then of course, as we think of larger diseases beyond rare disease, the vector production would require a stable producer cell line and larger than 200 liter bioreactors. But I think, um, you know, that's, that's down the road. And although we have automation in place, for, again, for larger diseases, there'll be continued research on next generation automation. Uh, very similar. I would say that uh, we have currently a platform process applicable to multiple uh, capsids and multiple genotypes. We are constantly innovating in every single unit operation. We have a suspension process in which the process is scalable, the bioreactors are scalable. This is single use closed systems. Each of those operations can be incrementally improved. And the, the aim is to further optimize your packaging efficiency to get higher yield of totally perfectly filled capsids. You know, I think as an industry, we've got close to that. And, and, and you know, suspension bioreactors can produce very high yield, uh, very filled uh, capsids. Now, going forward, what we're doing is similar, but this is a longer term view, is creating producer cell lines for each particular capsid and developing the types of cells that can house those different capsids. And eventually, you might want to have producer cell lines for your entire viral vector. That's difficult because I mentioned earlier, ideally, you want to have pre-IND the process you're going to take into BLA. And to have the producer cell line for your entire product is a, an expensive endeavor before you've taken it into the clinic. So I think producer cell lines uh, that at least um, use, that, that have the wrap and cap in them, that then can be used for multiple different viral vectors is probably the next big step for a platform process. Understood. And so a question for Zandi specifically. Uh, in the AV space, I mean, investors are aware of increasing talk around having better processes, assays, analytics, uh, and that's apart from hard assets, like bioreactors, 
but sometimes they have a hard time understanding what this means. These are murky issues for some, some people. So could you discuss these dimensions, how they can be innovated to improve a product? And if you have specific examples, you know, how do we tell that a company is actually good at these things is what I'm is, getting. Sorry, you just broke up. How do we tell a company is good at? That, that a company is good with, let's say, process, assays, analytics. Um, you know, I'm just trying to get some tangible examples of why these are important or how they can be innovated to improve a product or cost or for investors to even measure. In, in right. Um, of all the assays, I mean, in, essentially, as, as we both mentioned earlier, is in order to release your material and show comparability of material made at different stages, you need really well qualified and validated assays. And some of those can be used in uh, across your platform, but other of those are specific for your particular viral vector. The most difficult of the QC assays that's specific to the viral vector, so not the platform QC, which one wants to bring in house anyway, is the potency assay. And this is something that we have really focused on, having a platform where we're developing organoid models, where you develop different cells that can express vectors with the, uh, with the promoter that's appropriate for your product. Remember, if you have a product that has a highly specific promoter, that's only expressed in a very small subset of cells like photoreceptors, you need to be able to, to bring a potency assay from an in vivo model where you're injecting into an eye where that promoter will be activated to a in vitro cellular model, which is what the FDA and regulatory agencies would prefer and maybe more reliable and reproducible. You've got to create the cells that will express appropriately via that specific promoter. That's just an example. So I can't emphasize enough how important having quite broad technology in potency assay development is if you're to be a gene therapy company with a pipeline of different products, because each of those potency assays uses potentially similar types of technology, but they're really bespoke. And, regular, and this is a critical aspect of the release of your material and has to be reliable enough to show that each batch is the same as the previous batch. In addition to an individual potency assay, what we're moving towards or are currently looking at is orthogonal methods, multiple potency assays, which all together give you an accurate picture of how much RNA one viral particle makes, how much protein is made, a biological readout that that protein is active, and all of those orthogonal methods will tell the regulatory agencies that your material on a per viral genome basis is potent in a quantitative fashion. Great, specific so, examples, I appreciate that. Yeah. So um, we heard Jeff, uh, it's still to you, Zandi, but we heard Jeff uh, mention going into larger indications. And so for AEV, um, there's talk of targeting mass market indications increasingly. So what are the key manufacturing considerations that will enable those opportunities? Is that for me? Yes. Yeah. Still to you. So, I, so I don't necessarily think mass market indications is necessarily massive scale immediately, many of the larger indications, certainly that we're targeting, use local delivery of smaller volumes. However, everything that we've talked about needs to be in place. You know, the high levels of purity, the good packaging efficiency, the um, all of the QC are all required for mass market. I mean, if this is a question of scalability, um, everything that we've discussed is, is working towards scalability of a process and, and having a platform process where the process is scalable within single use bioreactors up to 3000 liters 
allows you with the same process to scale up from clinical batches to mass market, large market supply using the same baseline process. I think it's very similar to everything we've been saying is having this consistency across process from early stage right through to late stage clinical development and commercialization is, is really important. Got it. And so a question for Andre. Um, you were talking about producing not just for developed markets, but for less developed markets. So can you talk about the special consideration there, how you can get, let's say, to all continents uh, that, that matter? Yeah, there are two completely different orthogonal answers to your question. One is technology, the other one is business. So from a technology perspective, you know, you need affordability, portability, scalability, all of the EDs that, that you want, right? Ability to get through regulatory, through a uniform regulatory process and so on. And so, you know, you have to develop a technology that is gonna be robust enough to be operated by relatively untrained operators. You have to develop the technology that enables the product to be manufactured at very, very low cost because you're gonna be addressing people who, you know, you think a $50 uh, per dose vaccine is, is acceptable and when people make $50 a year, not so much, right? So, so you need to be able to, to do all these different things. The other piece of this, which I think is fundamentally important is how do you, how do you as a for-profit company deal with this new concept of not recouping the costs of your investment, not only in manufacturing, but in fact in R&D, not solely in the United States and five countries in Europe. How do you truly globalize your business model so that you're actually looking at the entire globe as your market opportunity? How do you partner? How do you distribute? How do you get you know, coincidental approval around the globe? And so obviously Greenlight is working on both, right? From a technology perspective, we're trying to make the manufacture of RNA much more scalable and, and a couple of orders of magnitude less expensive. Uh, we're trying to make our plants modular so that they can be copied and pasted in, in different parts of the world. We're trying to have a global center of manufacturing excellence in the Boston area so we can train the operators from around the world. And so those are the technology answers. The business answers are enormously more complex. Uh, again, for vaccines, relatively straightforward, especially if it's a single vaccine. Once you get into the realm of, hey, we may need to boost people not once a year, but in fact, twice a year, we may need to be making new variants of concern, vaccines for new variants of concern for the next decade, potentially. And how are we gonna do that? And how are we gonna pay for all that? Now you're starting to get into philosophical questions of who should pay for mm -hmm. the fact that we need to protect ourselves as a global species against further mutations by this COVID virus. You have to start thinking about who pays for the insurance policy against a potential influenza pandemic, which may be coming down the pipe. And then of course, how do we, pay for giving access to advanced gene editing technologies for people in geographies where those therapies cannot be afforded. And so those more fundamental philosophical questions remain to be answered. We can answer the technology questions. We're gonna need you know, the global healthcare community to help us answer those more philosophical deeper questions. Very quick, because we're running out of time, but I appreciate if you could each give me a one-liner on what trend we might be talking about next year at our manufacturing uh, summit. So Andre, to Zandi, to Jeff. Yeah, I'm afraid we're still going to be talking about getting over COVID. <laughs> Sorry. Dan. I think we'll still be talking about QC and supply chain and, and yeah. And Jeff? Yeah, I, I, I think major advances in analytics some of them have been touched upon, but I think that, that a lot is going on, a lot has been researched that are gonna really help the field. Great, and then I like to close these panels by asking each panelist to ask one other panelist a question because you're the expert, so you, you know better questions than I do. So Jeff, why don't you ask a question to the panelists, Andre, and then Sandy, you close it out with your question. So Jeff, go first, please. Oh boy, okay. Um, well, well, I guess what I'm curious about is how do you think about process development in, in your technologies? Which elements do you invest in, build internally versus rely on external? And who's that question to? Uh, well, may, maybe I'll, I'll go to Zandi. 
Interesting question. So when we set up the company, uh, it seemed to us at this stage in gene therapies as, a, as an industry that we aimed to bring manufacturing infrastructure, process development in-house. And as we've developed our own facilities and, and process, we've moved both upstream. So we've bought GMP plasmid in-house and now QC in-house for reasons of cost as well as time and bottlenecks. So we more and more bring more and more in-house. As you're in an innovative manufacturing space, it's extremely difficult to not be able to do this each step in-house. Great, Andre? Yeah, I guess to uh, both Jeff and Zandi, how do you, how do you deal with the uncertainty of the quality of your product as more precise analytics are discovered. In other words, your product may be well defined by today's analytical standards, but a new analytical standard may come up in three months and tell you, well, you know what, these batches were in fact different. How do you reconcile with the advancement of analytical technologies, potentially ahead of regulatory advancements? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. I mean, we, we generally view it as good news. You know, I mean, that we're, we're investing in single cell BCN, automated transduction assay, single cell transcriptomase analysis. So things that we didn't have when, when, when we got started. But I think our general belief is that if, if we're going to have any hope of doing any process changes going, going forward or meeting regulatory standards, we're going to have to do the most rigorous characterization as early as possible. So we wish we had that earlier, but we didn't. And I, I think that we're just trying our best because the more we can get these, you know, deep level fingerprinting of what's going on at the cellular level, the, the better chance we're going to be able to link um, our, you know, historic to our, our, you know, post process changes. And we do have retained samples from our early clinical work. So sometimes this new innovation, we can go back and, and link it. I would completely agree. It's always good news to have a much tighter assay. And you remember, you can use all of those assays we have in process retained. So you can use those much tighter assays to getting a much closer understanding of your process and where that particular element is changing and how to address it. Right. We have just one minute left. So Zandi, the final question. Um, I would say, let's, uh, to, to Jeff, um, how do you actually quantify the value of your in-house manufacturing to your business near term and longer term? Because all of us have invested a huge amount in, yeah. in our manufacturing. How do you quantify yeah. Well, so for, for us, because we're a little bit atypical is that we, we mapped out the whole value chain and we said, which parts do we want to own and not? And the whole focus was that we wanted to automate. You know, we wanted to go small rather than big because in the ex vivo world, what we felt is that if we can manufacture in these small automated pods, you know, the size of a dishwasher, but fully closed systems, it will let us scale, you know, that we, we can pick up these pods and put them in, Melbourne, Australia, or Houston, Texas. And if you hit the go button, the robot doesn't know if it's in Melbourne or Houston. It's the same drug product, this the same algorithms. And so that that was the key focus. And so how do we how do we justify that? On the in the short term, what it's allowed us to do is to save money because we don't have to build out the, the big infrastructure. But it's also allowed us to globalize because you know, in there's some limitations to the ex vivo world. The, uh, the drug product is frozen, but the apheresis step isn't. And so without this automation, we don't think we could actually globalize. And some of the comments that Andre made about being able to reach patients around the world, we, we think that this will allow us to do it. So in the short term, we think there's big money savings, but importantly in the long term, if we decide that we do want to build the bricks and mortar, we don't have to validate necessarily new facilities. You just have to do simple engineering runs because the controlled environment remains within the automated pod. And so we, we just think it gives us flexibility and, and translates into money. Great, thank you all for uh, the wonderful answers. Thank you, Andre, thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Zan.
Thank you, Bola. Thank you, everybody. We conclude this session.